Good morning. Uh, as as you, uh, if you, if you haven't been here, we've been uh, teaching through the book of Daniel, and uh, Daniel is a story about God's people being taken to a very foreign place, and uh, just how how Daniel and a few other Jewish men have to react according to where they are. Let me move that so I don't trip on that. And I was very encouraged last week. You know, people came up to me and. You know, usually Robbie Northcutt, he, he tells me that uh, my sermons get better every week, which I'm still not sure what that means. Uh, you have to start from somewhere. Uh, but lots of comments about how, how great the sermon was, and that's great that there were so many good points because this week's sermon might be pointless. I'm not sure. Um, I've been challenged all week to think about just what does God want to say uh, through uh, Daniel chapter 5. And uh, because basically it's a story of a sovereign God ex- exercising his sovereignty and showing an evil king uh, who he is, which is not too un- uh, dissimilar from what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, but the story ends differently. Uh, you know, in, in the recent weeks, uh, the whole world watched as the longest reigning monarch was celebrated, uh, Queen Elizabeth II. And, uh, you know, as an American, I'm naturally, I've been brainwashed to be rebellious. uh, But at the same time, like, there's there's no such thing as, I mean, this is just a person. But at the same time, as a Christian, you have to say that the Bible talks about God placing people in authority. And not only that, but Queen Elizabeth II did it with dignity and honor, and she was a believer, and and really... uh, you know, for what it means for her to be queen, she did it well, I guess. Uh, but uh, it's just something that's so foreign to me. I don't know how to respond to uh, the idea that I'm supposed to honor somebody because of their position. You know, as, as Americans, it's just, you know, everybody's the same. Uh, you know, about a month ago, I had the privilege of serving on jury duty. And when I say privilege, I mean it, okay? I would do jury duty for free. And I think everybody lies when they say they don't want to serve on, who, who wouldn't want to have someone's life in their hands? I mean, and the drama of the courtroom. I don't understand why people hate jury duty. I would volunteer to do it. I think it would be so much fun. Uh, I think people just pretend because it's, uh, it's a funny or popular thing to do. Or maybe I'm weird. Uh, but again, I had this moment of, of, foreignness strike me in the courtroom when this very proud bailiff knocked on the door three times boom 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 all rise all stand in honor of judge whatever and honestly the first thing that came to my mind is why do I have to stand for this person you know I mean and that's I think just part of our culture is that everyone is is all men are created equal Um, I mean that that is generally a part of of who we are what we've been taught and grown up uh, to learn. Uh, but the judge actually proved to be very worthy of honor and respect and so on. But it's our nature to rebel against things that demand honor and respect that aren't us. <laughs> right? We are what deserves to be honored. We're the one. You know, have you ever noticed, and I, I see this kind of thing a lot, um, you know, nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody, nobody, nobody ever invites me out. Nobody ever does this. But you know what? Those same people never do those things to anybody else either. We're always looking for somebody else to come to us, to greet us, to honor us, to extend to us. You know, we, we have this idea that we are worthy of honor. We are worthy of respect. But we don't so naturally think to give it to others, do we? So today's story is about how one king responds to the honor and glory of God, or rather how he doesn't. So what what I want to argue today is that everyone must acknowledge on the most basic level that God is sovereign, that he's in control, uh, and that he holds our life in his hand, and we are all accountable to respond to that truth. So the, the subtitle to that premise is this. It's up to you to decide whether God being in control is a good thing or a bad thing. Some people buck against it, and some people take comfort in it. Uh, the man and woman of God ultimately should confess that through the experiences of life that it's good that God is sovereign. 
and the wicked and indifferent either rebel or wander hopelessly through life, never quite figuring out why they're here or what their life is about. And we have both of those, those stories here in Daniel 5. Y'all pray with me this morning. Uh, it's important that we seek God to understand his word this morning. Lord, we bow ourselves before you as we open your word. And uh, we confess, Lord, that we think way too much of ourselves. I confess, Lord, that I think too much of myself. That I am the one typically who's in authority over my life, Lord. I pray to recognize you as sovereign in every moment and that you would bring the life and health that that brings and that it brought to Daniel. Lord, help us to recognize our faults. Help us to recognize your goodness and run to you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. So we're picking up in Daniel chapter 5, verse 13. So King Belshazzar, this is not Daniel's name, Belteshazzar. It's similar, but it's different. He's been struck with fear by this thing that God has shown him. And uh, we'll, we'll go through exactly what he was doing and, and when. That's pretty crazy. Uh, so verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. And the king answered and said to Daniel, you were that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. I've heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and to make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I've heard that you can give the interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, I want you to remember how Daniel responds right here. Verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples and na uh, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was make li made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and of gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed, and this is the writing that was inscribed on the wall. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, uh, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple, a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the, the, Cal, uh, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. 
So it doesn't have quite the happy ending that the story of Nebuchadnezzar had, right? Uh, all throughout the story of Nebuchadnezzar, he's beginning to recognize God. He's continuing, continuing to recognize a little more about God, but he just never, ever repents until God basically drives him crazy. His proud and hardened heart, God, God judges him, gives him a sentence, and at the end of that time, he becomes a child of God. What an amazing thing, right? The most powerful man on earth who is walking on top of the roof of his kingdom, looked out, literally, imagine the biggest house in Pearland, or the tallest skyscraper in Houston, and the man that owned it and was on top of it, literally above everybody else, talking about how proud he was of what he had built for his majesty and honor and glory, and God strikes him and gives him the mind of a beast right there. But at the end of that time, he turns and becomes a child of God. One day, if you're a believer, you will see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. I truly believe that. It's a crazy thing. Now, uh, if you've looked at your bulletin, there is a very sad fact on the back of that. If you read the title of the sermon. And the title of today's sermon is that God has no grandchildren. Uh, Belshazzar was not uh, the, the term for father. When it says your father, Nebuchadnezzar, could be the same. And we know that uh, Belshazzar was actually Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And why do we say that God has no grandchildren? Because in John chapter 1, throughout the Bible, people who believe in God, he gives the right to become children of God. There's nowhere in the Bible that, that talks about God's grandchild. They're only sons and daughters. And guess what? Belshazzar did not receive any kind of faith, did not receive any kind of uh, hope or repentance or anything from his grandfather. He was all on his own, and he didn't choose uh, wisely. So, uh, on the one, we, this this the story has two contrasting characters, doesn't it? It has Daniel, the super faithful, super loyal, uh, on one hand, and we have Belshazzar, the rebellious king, on the other hand. So. Um, What you don't see in the story, or is a small clue, is look with me at verse, um, verse 30, yeah, verse 30. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So the curious thing is, do you, do you guys think that, like, the gates were open of Babylon and somebody just walked in? Just like that? No. He was throwing this party while the Persians were at the gate. So I don't know what you want to call this. I don't know if you want to call this trying to, uh, to stir up the troops, to cheer them up. I don't know if this is eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. But this man is incredibly foolish. Uh, in his moment of greatest need or his moment of uh, about to be defeated, what does he do? He says... You know the, uh, how my, my grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, he destroyed the temple, and we took all the lampstands and gold, all the things that they worship God with? I want you to bring those things in here, and we're going to drink wine out of them while we basically have something like an orgy. I mean, it is a horribly uh, just disgusting situation. And, and this is his reaction. A and he's struck with fear by this sign. And I want you to think about the statement that God has no grandchildren. What's the first thing that Belshazzar does when he's struck with fear? What's the first thing he does? Who does he ask for? The Chaldeans, the astrologers, the wise men. That sound familiar? That sound familiar at all? Has that happened anywhere in the book of Daniel so far? Every time that Nebuchadnezzar is struck with fear or received a vision, what does he do? He asks for these same, uh, same guys. Even though Daniel, God's people, are the only one who gives him the answer every time. So I want, if you're taking notes, I want, I want you to write this down, and it's not mine. But it's from a guy named Pete Scazzaro. And he says this, that Jesus may live in your heart, right? Jesus may live in your heart, but Grandpa lives in your bones. Jesus may live in your heart, but Grandpa lives in your bones. 
And there's a lot of truth to that because whatever culture, your home culture you were raised in, to put it frankly, if daddy dealt with problems by drinking, you're probably going to be prone to do that. Not only might you be genetically predispositioned to do that, it's the coping mechanism that you have been taught your, uh, your life growing up. If mama gossips to make herself feel better about herself, what are you going to do? It's going to just come so natural to you to take these unhealthy coping mechanisms and try to use them to solve your problems. So even for the people of God, which Belshazzar was not, but I'm assuming most of us here are, even though you are saved by grace, that, that you stand redeemed and justified, you still have very unhealthy things in your life that come very, very naturally to you, don't you? The answer is yes, you, you most likely do. And so we see Belshazzar do the same exact thing that Grandpa does. He goes to the same thing to try to solve his problems, uh, and uh, he's, he chooses to spend his final hours in abject foolishness and rebellion against God rather than repenting and turning to life. The other side of the story is Daniel. Now let me ask you, if somebody's brave enough to answer that doesn't know the answer, how old do you think Daniel is? 31? How old do you think? <laughs> He's been in Babylon for over 50 years. He's not a young man. Daniel that gets thrown in the lion's den is not 25 years old like he was in my my children's storybook Bible, okay? He's almost 80 years old. He is an old man. He is, he is just, and he's, live, he's been torn away from his land. He's living in a foreign land for an evil king. And what, what kind of condition is he in? Oh, you know there was a man in your grandfather's reign. They didn't even know where he was. He had to go and be found. He was so forgotten and out of the picture. And, and when he's brought in to solve the problem, tell me he doesn't sound like an old man. You keep your stuff for yourself. I don't need anything you have to give me, right? He, he's, he's begun used to living a life in exile. He's okay with being forgotten. That's, that's not what he needs. But forgotten, still in the foreign land, still not living the dream, Daniel is dragged from his home in front of a wicked king to offer revelation um, even though that Daniel had been forgotten by everybody else, God had not forgotten Daniel, and he's, he seems to be content. So, one of the unfortunate things we see is Belshazzar's response to this event. Basically, he's given this supernatural judgment, right? He's struck by fear and terror and his wickedness. A hand is writing a, a, a message of warning to him. He's given the interpretation, and what's his response? He doesn't do anything. He doesn't do anything. All he does is give Daniel what he promised him he would give him. Think about the difference between that and Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, at least there was baby steps towards God. Oh, there is a God in heaven. I believe that now. And oh, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he must be a God of power that's, that's bigger than all the other gods. And then when he had his belly in the dirt, eating the, the grass like an ox, at the end of it, there is only one most high God in heaven. See, at least there was progression. At least there was recognition of who God is. But Belshazzar, there's nothing. He has no interest. He doesn't even say anything about God. He just gives Daniel his royal purple, his position, and his gold, and that's it. Not a step closer to God. Shady Crest helping people take one step closer to God. Daniel tried. <laughs> Belshazzar wasn't interested. Uh, in fact, his heart was just hardened against God. I guess it's admirable that he was good to his word, but he, he doesn't take any kind of step closer to God at all. So, you know, typically uh, when I preach... There, there's an overriding principle, and I, I say something like, if we want to do this, we must. I don't have that this week. The story just tells three different options of how we are to respond to God. Uh, one of the ways we can respond to God is that we can be like Belshazzar, is we cannot respond at all. 
Uh, the, the series and the events of life can do nothing but harden us. You can, you can choose to live that way. Um, a, but actually what he did was worse than nothing. <laughs> uh, nothing would have been great. What he did was he, he was leading pagans in a very sensual worship service to pagan deities with the articles of the temple. Things that would have been used to praise God, he was using to praise for like pagan gods, idols. Look with me at verse uh, 29. Then Belshazzar gave the command, Daniel was clothed, uh, and he was given uh, his position. Uh, Daniel gives him the bad news, but there's no humility, no responding to the message. His conscience is seared, his heart is hardened, he does nothing to respond to the God whom he's just defied. And then earlier it says, And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. Have any of you in your life ever seen somebody you know that you love crash really hard? I mean, just destroy their life. Anybody? Yeah. And then have you seen some of those same people be restored by God? I mean, Daniel is, God is telling Belshazzar through Daniel, you saw this. You saw God save your grandpa and you did nothing about it. You have no excuse. But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. You and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them and have praised the gods of silver and of gold, of bronze, iron, wood, stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Now, this is an exceptional case, right? I mean, it's a rare thing for, for somebody to be this hardened toward God, but you, there's no way you can look back in your life and say that in some way you have not hardened your heart towards God in, in some small thing at least. The second way we can respond is that we can respond to what God has done with repentance like Nebuchadnezzar. God humbled him. He became a worshiper, a believer, a child of God. Even though this man literally destroyed Jerusalem, literally destroyed the temple, God loved that man enough to take his sanity away from him, to bring him to, to the knowledge of God. And the last thing, this is not my term, but this is uh, from, from the title of a book by Eugene Peterson. We can be like Daniel. We can respond by pursuing a long obedience in the same direction. Okay, if, if somebody can say that about you at the end of your life, that you have pursued a long obedience in the same direction, I can guarantee you that you've lived a good life. Verse 17 says, Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Daniel says, I'm satisfied. I don't need anything that you can give me. Uh, it really struck me when I read that, that Daniel responds like the old man that he is at this point. He doesn't need anything. And he sounds like Paul. When Paul said in Philippians, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And he goes on to say that I can do all things through Christ. He also says later that godliness with contentment is great gain. That's 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. The temptation of man is to see ourselves as sovereign when the most important decision of our life is how we respond to the sovereign. All right, Gavin, can you pull up this clip for me? And before you play it, let me give a little bit of context. This is from a, a, a pastor, I think he's in Cleveland, his name's Alistair Begg, and what he's talking about here is uh, one of the thieves that was on the cross next to Jesus. It was the one who defended him and he was granted paradise for it. If it doesn't play, he has a Scottish accent that I will not imitate, okay? (laughs) 
without the preaching of the cross, without preaching the cross to ourselves all day and every day, we will very, very quickly revert to faith plus works as the ground of our salvation. So that to go to the old uh, Fort Lauderdale question, if you were to die tonight and, and, and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer that, and if I answer it in the first person, we've immediately gone wrong. Because I, because I believed, because I have faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. Loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person, because he, because he. Think about the thief on the cross. Oh, what an immense, I can't, I, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you were, you were, you were, you were cussing the guy out with your friend. You've never been in a Bible study. You never got baptized. You, never, you didn't know a thing about church membership. And, and, yet, and yet, you made it. You made it. How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said, you know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What, what do you mean you don't know? Well, because like, I don't know. Well, you know, we, uh, uh, did you, <laughs> excuse me, let me get my supervisor. They go get the supervisor ranger. So we have just a few questions for you. First of all, are you, are you, are you, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? <laughs> the guy said, I've never heard of it in my life. And, and what about, uh, let, let's just go to the doctrine of Scripture immediately. This guy's just staring. And eventually, in frustration, he says, on, on what basis are you here? And he said, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. <laughs> now, now, that's the... That is the only answer. That is the only answer. And if I don't preach the gospel to myself all day and every day, then I will find myself beginning to trust myself, trust my experience, which is part of my fallenness as a man. If I take my eyes off the cross, I can then give only lip service to its efficacy while at the same time living as if my salvation depends upon me, and as soon as you go there, it will lead you either to abject despair or a horrible kind of arrogance. And it is only the cross of Christ that deals both with the dreadful depths of despair and the pretentious arrogance of the pride of man that says, you know, I can figure this out and I'm doing wonderfully well. No, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. That's why Luther says most of your Christian life is outside of you in this sense that we know that we're not saved by good works. We're not saved as a result of our professions, but we're saved as a result of what Christ has achieved. Awesome. Thank you, Gavin. So if you were to die today, <laughs> you were to stand before God, and you were to answer that question, why should I let you into my heaven? I mean, what do you all think about that? If your response starts with an I, if it st starts in the first person, you're probably starting on the wrong foot. I think part of that is because of just how we've talked of faith and of receiving Christ. But the fact of the matter is, even if you've received Christ, it's because God softened your heart and opened your eyes to do so. And uh, you, you don't receive credit for your salvation. Uh, I ran across that a couple weeks ago, and as I was thinking about this story, I thought it was really uncanny how the two criminals that were crucified next to Jesus mirrored Nebuchadnezzar and mirrored Belshazzar. Listen to the story. The soldiers also mocked Jesus, coming up to him and offering him sour wine and saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. 
There is also an inscription over him saying, this is the king of the Jews. And here are the criminals. One of the criminals who were, who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Kind of like Belshazzar. Just total rebellion, hardness towards God. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing. And Jesus said to him, or when he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. So I ask you, what is your response to God? God is sovereign. Your lungs have fallen and rose several hundred times while you've sat here. Maybe very deeply, depending on how you hear my voice. <laughs> and your heart has continued to beat several hundred times while you've sat here. Is that because of you? The Bible says that every breath of yours is in God's hand. Do you recognize him as sovereign? And when you hear the word sovereign, do you think good? Or do you think someone who's trying to restrict me to take a hold on my life, to, to ruin my fun? We can rebel, we can hate God, we can ignore God, we can run from God, or like the other criminal, you can plead for the mercy of God and recognize that while we may be due justice, Christ answers for it. And like Nebuchadnezzar, bow ourselves humbly before God. Our response to a sovereign God is pretty simple. You can either receive it as good or you can hate it and run from it and be hardened from it. How are you responding to the mercy and grace of a sovereign God? Are you pushing through life in stubborn arrogance? Are you approaching life with humility to a sovereign God who loves you, who provides for you, and while he holds your breath in his hand, he calls you friend? Do you know him as friend? Uh, if you're his, that's how Jesus refers to you. Are you going to pray with me this morning? Lord, I don't, I don't even know how to respond to the message. My, my life is so uh, mixed up and there are areas of, that I know that I have not surrendered to you. Uh, but whether I surrender or not, I confess that you are sovereign. I confess that you're good and you will never stop pursuing me because I'm yours. I pray that if there's someone who, who doesn't know you, who's not a child, who's been running, who's been re rebelling, refuses to acknowledge you, Lord, that they would repent, that you would soften their heart, you would open their eyes, that you would perform a miracle today, uh, that you would change their hard heart uh, for a soft heart who know, knows you and trusts that you are good. We thank you for being who you are, and we confess that it's good. And we pray this